Hi, everybody in podcast land. I'm James. I'm David. I'm Riley. And this is the Carpool Critics Movie Podcast, where today we are discussing Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey from 1968. Spoiler alert! Or really not, because this is the one movie I think people maybe should have spoilers for. Yeah, it'll be good. But we'll get into that. What? Regardless, we're going to talk about the movie. If you haven't seen it, it will be spoiled for you, just so you're aware. And there are only three things happen, so... <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. All right, Dave, what are you giving this movie out of 10? Groundbreaking, genius, and possibly the most important work of science fiction in film ever. 2001 hasn't aged a day. It's aged every day of its 52 <laughs> long, arduous years on this planet. <laughs> what? I'm not going to rate this movie. What? You have to rate no. it. If you haven't seen it and you want to call yourself a movie buff, you 10 out of 10 have to see it. It's not a good watch. It doesn't hold up. It doesn't hold up. <laughs> what? You have to rate it. I'm not going to. It, it, rate it just something neutral if you're going to uh, rate it. Peaches out of apples. Great. That actually probably makes about as much sense as this movie. Oh. Hey, you want my slogan? You guys are haters. Oh, I can tell. Okay, how about you? you? My slogan is, honestly, fuck Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> What is going on? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, the rate I gave it five out of ten because Ooh. because here's the deal. I mean, we'll get into it. Obviously, maybe you should just go first, James. Okay, fine. Yeah. A tour de force for lovers of model spaceships, classical music, and transcendental egg babies. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I hear what you guys are saying. I'm going to give it a 9.5 out of 10. Whoa! I think that's an absolutely valid rating. But I don't so, think so. But so is a four. Yeah. Like, it, it really depends. And honestly, I'm kind of giving... Let me back up. I know there's been episodes where I've been like, you know what? This movie was probably really cool when you saw it in the 80s. But I'm watching it in 2020. So screw you. I'm giving it a six or yeah. whatever. And today, just because of my own nostalgia and bias, I'm totally doing the opposite of that. And I'm watching in 2021. I'm sitting through all the long, like model spaceship shots, and going. I bet that was mind blowing in right. '68. Totally, and, I and I'm giving it a 9.5 for that. There's Absolutely. definitely, there's definitely t points in the movie where I'm like, oh, this must have been really cool for them in like 1968. But I think that I, me not being somebody who have was alive in 1968 and had the opportunity to see this movie in theaters, true, I have to rate it, you know, in in the context of the broader. Uh, work in the uh, the medium is what I meant to say. Yeah. Um, so like, I think things change over time. I think that it probably has some sort of special status as like a movie that inspired so many movies subsequent to it. And, and yet is unique. It, yeah. it is unique. Yeah, yeah. It's still, it's still, there are parts of it that really hold up. Um, but as a movie watching experience, I think that even if I went and saw this in 1968, it probably would have blown my mind, but at the same time, uh, it's so boring. <laughs> like it's <laughs> it's so boring. It's such a boring movie. Well, I want to talk about like the really amazing stuff because this movie is dense with a yes. bunch of brilliance. But before sure. we do that, let's talk about our sponsor, King of Segways. That's our David Carpel Critics. is supported by Manscaped's Performance Package Kit. It comes with a ton of stuff, including their new lawnmower waterproof trimmer with advanced skin safe technology, their crop preserver ball deodorant. <laughs> and the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. And their new Shears 2.0 Luxury Nail Kit. It's a list of four, always trips you up. All in their Shed Travel Bag, which isn't crap quality. You can tell from the zipper, which is good. Head to manscaped.com forward slash carpool20 today and get 20% off plus free international shipping and a pair of their anti-chafing boxer briefs. This is crazy. Whoa. Available for a limited time. Okay. We're also brought to you by Private Internet Access VPN. PIA helps you hide your true IP address so that you can bypass geo restrictions and censorship. You can connect up to 10 devices at once and it, in kill <laughs> and it includes an internet kill switch. <laughs> if your VPN gets disconnected involuntarily. PIA is available for Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, and even as a Chrome extension, so check it out at lmg.gg slash carpoolcritics. Why are you laughing? I was laughing because we have like this internal meter where we all knew when to stop. <laughs> it's just pretty spot on. Bizarre. Okay. That's music, baby. I think the key to this movie is not to watch it in one sitting. I've done enough Space Odysseys in my life. Uh -huh. You break it up. You gotta break, <laughs> you, you gotta break it up. Both the movies and being Real. enhanced. Yeah. Just going nuts, dude. Well, I mean, that's the story is like the, a big reason why this movie made its money back is all the hippies that would drop acid to watch like the trippy optical oh, really? effects. Oh, really? I'm like, great. I get it. Yeah. That's so funny. It doesn't hold up today. Like that's something you could do in like iMovie in five minutes. Right. But in 68, that was yeah, pretty cool. Because it didn't get great audience reception right away, right? No. And like a lot, like every Kubrick movie, a lot of critics really don't like it. Like 
there's some people that were like really ripped into it. They were like, Kubrick is trying to make himself like a myth maker, and this myth myth has been told, and it's all garbage. And yeah, yeah. I mean, how about that synopsis? Oh sure, all right. Oh, wait, before you say that, I gotta give a shout out to our convoy of listeners. Usually, I do this oh. earlier in the episode. Mm. Next week, what are we watching, boys? Jurassic. Da na na. Sort of. I, 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 was, I was trying to do a T Rex. <laughs> We're doing Jurassic Park. I I started doing a theme song, and then I realized that's Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Remember the other day though, we realized that the Jurassic Park and Lord of the Rings theme songs can totally. Medley together? Mm. Can they? Yeah, remember we did this. We're, we're I remember walking around being uh, asking everybody, hey, what song is this? Da, na, 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 na. <laughs> knowing okay. that yeah, knowing well, that it's Jurassic Park. Stay tuned Park, for that course. Jurassic Park episode <laughs> next week where we will show you how those songs medley together. We'll perfectly. show you how dinosaurs reproduce. <laughs> how do they do it? How about the synopsis? Okay. <laughs> So to synopsize this movie is to pretend to have an actual objective understanding of what the hell happened for nearly two and a half hours, but here we go. In the prehistoric era, ape-like hominids live in peace with tapirs. (laughs) (laughs) Suddenly, a black monolith appears. Shortly afterwards, the hominids figure out how to use bones as weapons. One of the chimp humans throws a bone up into the air, and it magically transforms into a spacecraft using the power of symbolism. Okay, that (laughs) represents it. It's just a match cut. Whoa! Whoa! Excuse me. I mean, if you haven't seen this movie, don't like impose your interpretation on me, okay, dude? Jeez. For people who haven't seen this movie, the bone doesn't literally transform into a spaceship. Look, if you haven't seen this movie, the synopsis will do nothing for you. Go watch the movie if you want to be bored for two and a half hours. Whoa! That's not true. It's a classic. You got to see it. Here we go. We're in the future now. Anyways, we're in the future now. Dr. Haywood Floyd, a representative of the Council, travels to the moon where he emphasizes the need for secrecy concerning a discovery that has been made there. Floyd and other moon-based personnel arrive at the lunar crater where another monolith has been excavated. It emits a high-pitched noise and the astronauts grab their heads in pain. Now we do 18 months later. The spacecraft Discovery 1 is en route to Jupiter, carrying astronauts Dave Bowman and Frank Poole, three more scientists in hibernation, and the HAL 9000 computer, which also controls the ship. When HAL recommends replacing the ship's communications module, even though nothing is wrong with it, Dave and Frank make plans to disconnect his higher brain functions. Frank goes outside to replace the module, but HAL uses an EVA pod to knock him into space, severing his oxygen tube. Dave manages to retrieve Frank's body, re-enter the ship, and shut Hal down, and in doing so, learns that the mission's true objective is to follow a radio signal sent from Jupiter, oh, sent from the lunar monolith to Jupiter. Arriving at Jupiter, Dave exits Discovery in an EVA pod to investigate a third monolith orbiting the planet, but is pulled into a vortex of colored light and made to sit through, what, 10 minutes of bizarre cosmological imagery. Eventually, he finds himself in a neoclassical bedroom where he sees, and then becomes, older and older versions of himself until another black monolith appears. He dies, and of course, becomes a glowing floating embryo. Naturally. Which enters the monolith and is last seen floating in space besides the Earth, as these things do. The end. (laughs) I think my favorite stuff in this movie is the crazy stuff. Like, I love... (laughs) Like the monkeys approaching the monolith and like the, the astronauts like freaking out by the monolith and like the, yeah. the final sequence. I think that stuff is still holds up in a really crazy way where like you can bring in your own interpretations. And like Stanley Kubrick it has been heard saying giving his specific explanation, but there's so much you can bring into it and, and absolutely just enjoy these weird, right. really heady concepts. Yeah, I, I really want to. Can we get into this? The phrasing here of with holds up. I, I want to attack you. Your guys is saying it really holds up, or it doesn't hold up. Because to me, this whole movie holds up. Like because it was all practical, and because they shot on seventy millimeter, it looks amazing in four K. Like none of the effects look like crap. That's not true. They all look sick. There's a lot of bad effects. Like there's a lot of like asteroids where the edges are soft, and like the, you could see where the sulfur vapor kind of didn't blend right. And like there's a lot of like in the 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 dawn of men but, age. The green screening of the sky, like the sky doesn't make sense for where the landscape but is, and it that, just pulls me out of I it. I think that even when I see that stuff, that's not though, a green screen. It's not it's the a, sky. It's a projector. It's a still. It's Whatever still imagery yeah, of the, the the perspective of it doesn't make sense. No, then. the perspective doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. That I think that even that stuff where you can like notice that it's a special effect. Yeah, that's a small thing. It's a small thing, and I think that I would I would sort of agree with James here where like the effects definitely hold up if you're looking at this understanding that it's from 1968 right if you watch it and you're like when was this made I had no idea you know if you watch a movie from like 2002 and you're like 
I thought this was made three years ago. It was so good, you know. Uh, that would be like okay, it holds up in every sense of the word. But I think this. I think I. The, I agree that the movie holds up in the sense that the effects look really nice, even though you are watching them knowing that this film was made in 1968. Like here's a list of movies that came out later that look way worse, either worse <laughs> or the same. Like. Like Star Wars. This is nine years before Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Nine years. The distance between today and Avatar is 12 years. Mm -hmm. And imagine the leaps and bounds that have happened since then. Like a nine year gap before. And in, even in Star Wars, yeah. they, they had to invent all this new technology yeah, yeah. to do what they were doing, right? It's 11 years before Alien. It's 14 years before Blade Runner. It's 21 years before The Abyss. Like, right. it looks sick. Today. I, think that I absolutely agree. And I think that like the, the, the special effects themselves look good. The problem is... They're not nearly as awe-inspiring as they were, mm -hmm. and I think that's 100%. a big that's a big part of the experience of this movie is this awe-inspiring experience of like watching these spaceships approach or watching a probe go to a planet for six minutes and like <laughs> that part of the experience like yeah. that doesn't hold up because like I've seen spaceships do that a hundred times. Yeah. Totally agree with you there, and I mean the result of that as a 2021 viewer, it's like this movie really could be. I don't know, 45 minutes long. Yeah. They could, <laughs> yeah. like, you probably watch a solid half an hour of just ships oh like, in space, yeah. which would have been crazy. It's it just like so when, cool. when we watch yeah. Interstellar, it's just yeah. so sick to watch the docking sequence, you know? Exactly. But I think that, like, even something like Interstellar, they have these long shots in space and it's taking a while for things to happen. But a lot of that is made, a lot of that kind of potential boredom is made up by. Made up is not the right. Made up for by tension. Yes, and mm. and dialogue and uh, music rising, uh, just the general like feel of things, kind of like eliciting this emotional reaction in you. Whereas in this movie, Kubrick kind of basically puts something on the screen, and then it's up to you to like make sense of it. Which I'm not against. You know, I'm not against like open ended narratives and uh, being open to interpretation and stuff, and the kind of having time for reflection in movies. But there needs to be something to reflect on, and there needs to be some sort of guidepost to guide the viewer along there, because there are so many shots. There are so many shots in this movie that are just way, way, way too long. And like, mm. obviously, this is a this isn't a new criticism. Everybody like this people is, have yeah. said this before, but like, there are so many shots where I, like I get the point, and I'm kind of reflecting on it, and I'm like, all right, I'm done here. Let's move on. And then Kubrick is like holding my hand, being like, uh uh uh, we have to stay here for another two minutes. For I, me, why? it really depends on what scenes you're talking yeah. about. Because if you're talking about when any, like, either monkey or man is walking towards the monolith, I'm happy with the length that they're Same. at. They are. But if you're talking about just, um, the Pan Am ship, like kind of rotating in the same axis as the space station as it lines up to like dock, yeah, then I'm with you where it's like, there's no emotion there. It's not like an interstellar where it's like, are they going to make this move? Like, yeah. can he manually drive the ship and do it? And it's yeah. crazy. And the skill level, there's no tension like that. It's just like, just the visual spectacle is all that that scene has. Yeah. And it sets a really cool music and that's it. Yeah. So if you're going to shorten that scene, then fine. I think though, in within this movie, they do have that where they're using the long shots for tension. Like when... Uh, not Dave, but the other astronaut gets like his thing disconnected and he flies away. Mm -hmm. There's lots of like long shots and like it's cutting between like crazy loud noises, like the beeping, the booping, and this complete silence. And it's using those pauses and those that like that tension in the quiet. And I think it, that's a good use of long shots within this movie. Mm. Uh, and so I think that he does both. And I think that he's trying to cue you up for what he's doing later, but we don't need that anymore. See, I. I, and I <laughs> I would say that the effect is almost the opposite of that, though. Hmm. Like, tension building is important, but the tension dissipates when you spend way too much time there. When someone has uh, room and time to acclimate to something, there's no tension anymore. Because we're this. Uh, oh, I'm used to this. I'm. I've been here before. Well, it's like kind of comedic. It's like when the pod is approaching him to pull the yeah. thing out. It's like, mm, and then it cuts to him, and it's like, mm, uh, uh, uh. yeah. And they and just keep getting closer and I'm, closer, I'm like, and you're like, all right. Like I, get it. I think of myself as a patient man. All right. Like I think I'm patient. <laughs> I I can sit in a room waiting for my turn to go or whatever, and just like be there for hours, and I'm totally fine. Like even if I don't have a phone or something, I'll just like stare into nothingness and just imagine things. I'm a patient guy. This movie's so freaking boring. <laughs> you know what's crazy about it is I, I knew that it's really slow and I like that. But then when I was watching last night, I was actually struck by how quick the pacing is. If you if you remove Shut the up. 
<laughs> How no, dare you? Continue, continue. How dare you? No, I almost reached kidding. over this table. Oh, James. It actually doesn't really slow down until you get to this space when they're just showing you all the spaceships and like the twinkly music. Mm. When, well, the overture and the, and the, and the landscape shots notwithstanding. Yeah. But when you get, I remember actually when I bought, when I got the DVD for my birthday from a, a friend, um, I put it in, I thought something was wrong with my setup because I was like, why can I hear it, but I can't <laughs> yeah. see anything? Because there's just music playing on a yeah. black screen. Yeah. But once you get to like actually seeing the monkeys, it's pretty concise. Mm -hmm. It's like opposing tribe, we lost the water hole. We see the monolith. Now we win the water hole. Now we're out of here. And then and it's the same thing with once you're introduced to Floyd. It's like he's yeah. on the station. They have this talk. Then they touch the monolith. They're gone. It's just there's so many interstitial 100%. look at this spaceship flying around yeah. that just really pads it out. Yeah, the, the actual scenes with dialogue and like where characters are doing things aren't that bad. I, I'll give you that. But like the, the monkeys, I think that... <laughs> monkeys, I mean... Whatever. Uh, those scenes, you know, they're moving around, they're doing things, uh, they're discovering things. Like, yeah, fair enough. But even in those, even in those parts, I'm kind of like, this whole story could have been told in half the time and still had the sense of awe and wonder and mystery. And we're like, what's going on here? You know, what does this mean? Like, I, I just, I know that Kubrick is this master, but I feel like he just like thinks too highly of himself sometimes where like, do you expect that I'm going to watch this? I don't know. Like some people obviously they watch it and they're like, Oh, this is amazing. This is so artful. But I, I don't know. I, I part, part, Sorry, maybe you go. I'll. Come I know. Back I just. Point. I. I agree. I think this is his most important film, but it's not his best film, and mm. it's it's the one that's most steeped in his pretension. Right. Um. And he's. It's really self indulgent. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no way around it. This is a very self indulgent movie. Yeah. Uh, and I think that, like you said, when they're kind of telling those story beats, it's moving and it's it's really interesting. You know, like oh, like what's this? He's got to lie about like what they found on the moon he's pretending that it's like a, a thing and then once they get into the spaceship with like like the the visuals of like the the centrifugal force yeah uh and like the 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 tension with how that stuff is really right. really interesting yeah but uh i'm very interested when that comes apart but i think that it kind of could be its own movie almost yeah and I, that's why I, I find the more I, I think about this movie i just feel like it's kind of separate and i get how everything ties together thematically mm. but i find I, that middle section where it's floyd uh, and they go to like the war room and they're discussing that stuff. That stuff needs to be condensed into like two scenes. Right. Oh, I like that. Really? I really like that. What do you like yeah. about it? I think they the way that they um, release the information to you is it's really good. Mm -hmm. Like when he first walks onto the space station and he sits down with those Russian scientists. Um, actually, first he has a call with his daughter, which if they're going to cut anything, it would be that. Because that. that's another scene where it's just supposed to be like, oh my God, imagine you could yeah. have video calls. That's video yeah. crazy. Phone? There's, there was two calls originally, and one was to the pet store to buy the puppy. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> the bush baby. She wants a bush, bush baby. Bush baby, that's it. It's yeah, like, yeah, you're right, you're right. Um, that's Kubrick's like, daughter, by the way. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> and I love her performance. This is like a real kid. Yeah, like she's delivering all the lines, but she's also like trying to scratch her back or something <laughs> the whole time. She's squirming around yeah. and like, standing up and sitting down and then the camera follows her which is another thing like we haven't had that until facebook portal yeah. with, like yeah, two that, years ago it's still the, pretty futuristic yeah, has, we had, there was video calls in star trek before this but they didn't track so oh yeah yeah, yeah. so, so this, okay and then he sees these scientists and the, they have some pleasantries but then they start to ask him like what's what's going on right and then as an aside when he approaches that group of russian scientists number one this is shot in the height of the cold war so he's interacting mm. with russians which, that yeah. was a sci-fi concept and very cool okay, and number two he uh, addresses and shakes the hand of a woman first mm. the, the whole and the group is mostly women it's like three out of four people That's are women cool. oh, and they're all scientists they're all phds so like it's progressive in, in those ways oh. right but just in terms of like is it captivating i think it is um part of it has to do with the contrast of like you've been you've heard nothing. Like the yeah. first dialogue was 25 minutes in. So even them just having a quiet, quaint, polite conversation is engrossing because you you haven't had any human contact <laughs> yet at all. Yeah. Give That's me fair. something. Well, I think visually too, like there's such a cool contrast between space and the interiors. Like space is black with little white speculars and inside is all like these big flat white lights. Like the floor is all lighting or right. like in the war room, it's just these big white panels. Yeah. And I think like visually, like you said, it's like a contrast. You had this cold nothing and then human interaction. You've had light versus darkness. Yeah. And you're right. So that in that way, it is kind of more interesting. And it's intriguing too, because they're like, 
hey, can you tell us what's been going on at the space station? He's like, whatever do you mean? I don't know anything about that. <laughs> well, no one's been able to talk to them for two weeks. Really? Yeah, they say there's an epidemic there. Huh. And then, and then they're like, you know, you know, so can you tell us? And then he's like, I do know but I'm not going to tell you. You're like, oh my oh, God, like it, yeah. it amps up. I think it's like really well told. Yeah, I think that it does a good job of kind of bringing you into this narrative because obviously, like, you know, we get there, we get there to moon and I'm interested in what is going on. Like, uh, it's just that my problem is, like if I'm giving this a five out of 10, those five points are... And I don't even know. You know. That five out of ten is kind of a joke rating, okay, guys. But like, uh, that's how I felt. It's a, mm. it's a, my subjective rating, okay. And if I'm giving it that five out of ten, part of those five points are these like amazing special effects that like are so visually amazing for the parts where I'm not bored. And the rest of those five points is the whole subject matter and the themes and everything because like this is a very open ended, abstract work. It's meant to be interpreted, and it does suck you in with these little human moments pointing at something mysterious, something otherworldly outside of our comprehension. Uh, and I think that those, these like scenes like this where he's like, oh, there's something going on, but I can't tell you yet. You know, it does draw you in. I think though, for me, the big difference between these scenes that I, that I like and the ones that I don't like is how Kubrick is using the camera to tell the story visuals. Like if you can compare that scene to when the two astronauts go in the pod to discuss how they're going to deal with how, you don't need the dialogue in that scene to understand what's going on. Like, they're suspicious of how they go in the pod. They're talking, and the camera's getting closer. The tension's getting tighter, and you see how in the background. And then it switches to this kind of like uh, like vignetted lens, right? And it goes between their lips. And like, you don't need to hear anything, know anything. You know, they're talking about how Wait a second. how you're saying that this movie should be more abstract. It should explain less to us. I'm what's not there on? yet. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> but you. Yeah, just by using the camera and the way that they're using uh, like these effects, you get a story. And I find with this, that scene at the beginning, it's not doing that as much. It's more keeping this, the camera in one place and showing you the sets. It's not as interested in using the camera to tell that story. Mm -hmm. Even when you say the beginning, you mean uh, just that scene in particular. The when they're at the one? space station, they're discussing with those chairs that became real chairs. Yeah, they had um, <laughs> they had a bunch of spots in this movie where they have like this kind of diorama kind of camera view. They have it in the monkey scene, kind of out of necessity because the way that they shot those is they didn't originally plan want to be on a sound stage they they had like all these all this data about like average temperatures and precipitation around the world <laughs> of like where they should shoot because they want a cool desert and they almost went to spain but then they did it and in the end it was on the sound stage and then that made them need to have this projection system so when you're watching those monkeys the background is a projector yeah so how does that work without there being shadows and stuff? There's like, if you're standing looking through the camera lens to your left, like perpendicular to you is the projector shooting at a mirror. So it reflects it at the exact same angle. Like the, basically the, the projector projection is coming out of the camera lens. So all the actors are casting shadows, but the shadows are directly behind the actors. Cool. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So the only monkey scene that is not on a soundstage is the one where um, the main monkey, who actually has a name, and it's Moonwatcher, uh, <laughs> he's smashing the skulls with the bone, like yeah. that big triumphant moment. And the reason that's not on the soundstage is because they sh it's shot from a low angle, like toward the sky, right. and you'd be able to see the studio lighting. Um, why am I talking about this right now? Because it's really cool. No, no, no. I, I, the diorama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so because of that setup, they couldn't move the camera easily. So instead, they take this... I'm going to zoom way out, and... You have to be like an active viewer to see, decide what you want to look at. And sometimes there's really nothing to tame the eye and you're kind of just looking around. Uh, and so that kind of, it has like benefits. Like maybe you could say, say like, oh, I'm like an observer watching this movie the same as like the aliens watching yeah. the earth. But that, uh, maybe that's intentional. Maybe it's just incidental because <laughs> they couldn't move the camera. Yeah. Yeah. But that kind of carries forward to these other scenes like that one in the space station where it's just a group of people sitting there. Um, but it plays out cool because there's a lack of edits mm -hmm. and a lack of camera moves. Mm -hmm. You have like when Floyd's talking to the male scientist and there's all this tension, the female scientist wants to cut the tension and like and say, OK, well, nice to see you again. And it moves on. You yeah. can see her like stirring in her chair and like mm -hmm. she recrosses her legs and like yeah. does a little kind of cough to like get the room's eye line back to her. Yeah. And it's, it's cool to be able to see all that rich richness yeah. which is kind of a byproduct of not moving the camera that's totally fair and i think kubrick one of his incredible skills is drawing out 
body language, like authentic body languages from these actors. Like mm. he's so good at making people seem uncomfortable. <laughs> right. And like having all of these background details that you might not notice the first time around, but then yeah. when you go through again, you're like, oh, look at this little thing I noticed. I think that uh, talking about like the, the camera the work in this movie, it seems like there's a kind of an overall level of sophistication that is, it increases, mm -hmm. that increases from like the dawn of man to the later parts. Like, I, as you say, the, the early, the dawn of man, um, part portion of the movie, everything's kind of like a flat shot. There's no, like, there's a, there's a couple close ups when he's like smashing the bones and stuff, but for the most part, it's just kind of these wide shots and like, it could be like a theater. It's like a play. And we're just like, sitting in the audience and there's the stage and we're watching it happen. But I think that in the second part, you know, with, um, with Floyd, things get a little more, uh, sophisticated. And then when we're on the sh spaceship with Hal, we have all of these close-ups on people's faces and like really experimental shots. And then mm -hmm. obviously things get super, super experimental in the last part. So I got, yeah, I can see like a progression yeah. there. That's kind of cool. I didn't really think about that totally. until now. Yeah, and I think uh, one thing that I really appreciate about it that is permeates the entire movie is how grounded in science the science fiction mm. is. Because you think about that time, and this is definitely something I can appreciate, is 1968, like, we hadn't been to the moon yet. So, like, uh, a lot of these... It was 69, wasn't oh, it? Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, First um, Man in Space was 62. But we hadn't been to the moon. Or 61. Yes, we hadn't so been, to, been to space. No, yeah. Uh, yeah, because there was, like, a, a thing going past Mars that... Yeah, we'll talk about that later. Um, Asteroids! <laughs> they actually didn't know what the yeah. Earth looked like. They didn't have any yeah. color photos of the Earth and, yeah. yet. And the fact at the time this movie came out, uh, when it came out, I think the first things existed. But while yeah. they're making it, no. Oh. So, so they actually had to, like, when they're painting the Earth, like a lot of the celestial bodies that they use. Obviously, it's not CG. It's just it's like um, painting on a, yeah. on a piece of glass right. or whatever that they back project. Okay. They, right. had, they had to take some creative license of what that was going to look like. And it's incredible that like 52 years later, they got a lot of stuff kind of right. Like yeah. that space station feels like a real space it station. Does. Like the, the, the celestial bodies look pretty real. And like the science fiction before that felt so naive, like stuff like Flash Gordon or all the pulp mm. science stuff is so silly. And this really did set the tone. And, and like in a lot of ways, science fiction, like more grounded, like severe science fiction or like, right. what is it? Hard, hard science fiction? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Uh, still is, has this flavor Right. All the way through. Yeah, it is interesting because people talk about Star Wars kind of like grounding science fiction and more of sort of like a lived in sphere yeah. where a lot of this Flash Gordon stuff, you know, there's like everything's made of shiny chrome and stuff and like, and then Star Wars kind of made things Tatooine. gritty. Yeah. yeah. And like things are dirty and used. And this one doesn't have it, things be dirty and used so much as it does make them look... Um, professional like it's it's less like ooh, we're in the far future and everything's fancy and nice as it is like things are practical yeah. we have to have our space stations, space stations turning around because we need our gravity well, you know? it's, it's so much in the little details too like when the astronaut's grabbing his meals out of the thing and like the way he grabs them like i bet they were actually hot like he he grabs them like they they must be at different temperatures because he has such a different reaction to he like each. shakes his hand out yeah and like hot. like at least one or two i was like oh that looked like it was actually hot maybe it's just a really good performance yeah maybe but those little details really add up to make it feel like it's such a well thought out science it's, fiction it says something about kubrick that we watch a movie of his and we <laughs> want to attribute that to like his uh you know amazingness well, I, one I, reading of it riley as opposed to it being like super lived in and there's kind of like these cowboys in space is that uh, the beginning of the movie is, you know, just these apes. They don't have any mastery of their planet at all. Mm -hmm. Then you fast forward after the, the aliens interact with them and kind of bestow them with this new consciousness. Uh, fast forward to spacefaring humans. Right. But on their spaceships, the whole time we're with Floyd and even the next guys, you see humans who, they, they're babies in space. They've mastered Earth. But mm -hmm. on space, they have to read big, long instructions about how to use the toilet. <laughs> yeah, they yeah, have to yeah. eat baby food through a straw. Right, right. They have to try to use shoes to walk on a spaceship like you would walk on Earth. Mm. Right. Uh, They're learning how to do all of these basic things again, like a baby might. Yeah. In space. Whereas the monoliths don't have to do that. <laughs> the monoliths just take a they crap just, wherever they want. They just appear. <laughs> yeah. They poop out moons, and that's just like they poop, they, they poop every, every once every couple billion years or something. Yeah, yeah. Can we talk more about monoliths? I don't think. Yeah, so. Yeah, please. I want to. There's lots to talk about with those yeah. puppies. There yeah. sure are. I don't. Is it worth talking about like uh, the basic what this movie is about in the sense that 
Like, there used to be, apparently, I read this a long time ago, I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard at some point that there used to be a, like, little, like, a prologue from Stanley Kubrick that before the movie started where he would kind of tell you. No. Like, I don't think that's true. And then they just removed he's it. He's been on record being like, I don't want to talk about this. And the only explanation that exists is an interview that he did with, like, a random documentarian that actually never got finished. Mm. And so it didn't exist until, like, 20 years later. And then we got this phone call from Stanley Kubrick being like, this is what the movie's about. I actually have a quote from a 1968 interview with Playboy where he says, you're free to speculate as you wish about the philosophical and allegorical meaning of the film, uh, but I don't want to spell out a verbal roadmap for 2001 that every viewer will feel obligated to pursue or else fear he's missed the point. I feel like a lot of that applies to the ending, mm. your interpretation of the ending, but I think we can all agree that the movie is about some kind of uh, alien race that's very advanced, right. that has essentially robots that go out throughout the universe and wait for other species to catch up. Oh, and man. So, well, that's a, that's assuming a lot, James. What, what do you mean? The ver- the first thing with the monkeys is alien thing appears, the monkeys touch it, they're smarter after. Yeah, but you think that... I, I feel like it's 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 assuming a lot. You're, you're, you're making it very, very rational when I think it's supposed to be sort of irrational. It's well, I think supposed that's the, to be that's just the, mystery. But that's the feeling that it's supposed to inspire in you. It's supposed to be like, wow, space is so mysterious yeah. and all these things. But I think that... That's an accurate reading of like if you boil it down to like the physical things that happen. I don't well, think but that just I- imagining that there's a species of aliens that like created a technology called the monoliths and then they go and bury them instead of it just kind of maybe being like a feature of the universe. Well, I okay, the, maybe I'm not saying in that this, that's what it is. No, I'm no, just no. saying that like you're taking a you're taking a leap okay, by here, saying here's this what, is what we it know. Probably here's is. what we know: an, uh, an alien thing, probably deliberately a non-human thing. An alien thing is there. It gets touched and it gives new knowledge to the to the monkeys. Mm. We know Does that. it? Yeah, because we don't know if it cause. It's not. We're not sure if it's a causal link. I, could okay. just, I, uh, it could just be there as it happens. Okay, but that's not. That's dumb. Well, I don't think it's dumb. Okay, that's possible, but that's not a movie. <laughs> uh, and then, so then they deliberately bury a monolith on the mm. moon, and then and Kubrick himself has said that this is supposed to be like a, a type of like burglar alarm. Like right. as soon as they they unbury it. Then they then it actually used to say in the script it doesn't say anymore but it's it is solar powered that's why when oh, it sends out that wow. signal and everyone's like ah because their radio things are yep. what you're hearing what us the viewer are hearing is their equipment reacting to uh, the signal that it I sends see. out ah. and when they do that and they hold their helmets the very next shot is the sun coming over the monolith because right. the sun just hit it it's like gathered that. enough energy finally and then it sends a signal to be like oh. This species got to the moon. I got molested. And then the, it's... They're ne- touching me. <laughs> <laughs> I need an adult. <laughs> the next monolith is at the edge of their solar system. So that's like, oh, right. now they progressed to here. Right, it, right, it's right. just like tripping all these alarms for the other yeah. species mm-hmm. to like know what's going on. Yeah. I, I see that. I saw the quotes where he was saying that like, that's like the, that's how the system works for sure. Oh, I like that. And I think it's, it's interesting to discuss like thematically, what do the monoliths mean? Because I don't think it's about like... Well, what if aliens came to Earth and gave us special knowledge? I yeah. think it's supposed to be like the monolith is kind of more abstracted so you can kind of bring in your own meaning. Like to me, it's like it's about like this experience that expands your imagination. And then all of a sudden, right. like your imagination is able to conceptualize using tools. And then for the humans, the second time, it's like, OK, they had this technology, but now like their mind is expanded to reach further and now that he's ready to be turned into a fetus. Yeah. Right. So you're saying it's not that like no, you, no, ready. you touch the monolith and it just like. Yeah, you're like Neo. They're like, whoa, I know kung fu. Yeah, you just think it's like, wow, if that exists, then maybe this, and it yeah. just pushes us farther. I'll, the thing is, that is a totally valid reading of the movie we actually got. But in earlier versions, uh, when they were like making of the, um, there was a, a time where the monolith was gonna have a screen on it that showed images uh, to the monkeys. Right. I'm glad it does. But that just looks stupid, yeah. and it's way better when you just have like a, a close up shot of the hand touching it. Totally, yeah, that's awesome. Well, and it's so ominous, like with that score that accompanies it, which is really haunting to this day. Right. Uh, th- movies are just better when you can bring in your own meaning. Like it does suck, and I totally get why Kubrick feels that way when someone tells you what it is, and then you can see the movie in one way instead of just like enjoying it as you want totally i mean uh, yeah and that i think that the the open-endedness of this gets to one of my core uh like disappointments with the film because i think that it on the one hand i love we talked in uh, in the horror movie episodes we've done uh, i like cosmic horror i like something that is truly truly scary is something that uh 
you don't understand. It's unknowable. Unknowable. Yeah, not even unknown. Like, it's not possible for us to grasp it, you know? And I think that that is truly scary and awe-inspiring. And so I like the idea. The, 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 the one idea that I love in this movie is, is the idea of, of that, of this monolith representing the fact that we are these stupid meat bags mm -hmm. who are trying to understand what the hell is going on yeah. and the universe exists out there and it's indifferent to our plight and our best attempts to understand it. We're like, we're making progress. We've done pretty good. We're going to make spaceships one day. <laughs> like we already have spaceships. A bit like but, you know interstellar I mean. spaceships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, um, yeah, there's just this like incredible mystery out there, and it's like who who the hell knows what's going on. So I like that aspect of the of the movie. What I don't like is the the execution in making it so abstract and so open ended that you watch the movie and it takes multiple viewings and reading about it afterwards and hearing people talk about it to understand to to begin to understand what the hell's going on. You I know. You might you might watch it the first time and be like, "Whoa, that expanded my mind. I'm going to start thinking about things now." And that's cool. But I, you know, and maybe I'm just asking to be taken along uh, like maybe. I I want to I want a track so, an easy track holding? for me to go along. Yeah, hand holding. But I've gone from thinking art is supposed to be this abstract thing that's open to interpretation and that the best art is like not final. And I still think that to a certain degree, but that's on like one end of this on, on one end of the spectrum, and then on the other end of the spectrum is please take me on a roller coaster and don't like make, confuse me too much. Just right. like it should be a fun ride, it should be entertaining. You want them to have a message and and communicate your message to me clearly. Yeah, and I just think this movie is too far to the open ended abstract end of the spectrum. If it was well, a little more on the in the middle, I don't want it completely. Like you know, fine, don't put it completely in the middle. But this is like pretty far to one end of the spectrum. I don't think it's that far if you just. Like, okay, the credits roll and you're like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. he's a giant fetus in space now? <laughs> yeah, what? Exactly. But if you just think about it for a second, you're like, okay, here's what we know. We know that when the monoliths show up, things get smarter, right? From yep. the monkey scene. Yeah. So if that holds true to subsequent encounters, mm -hmm. then when Dave interacts with the final monolith that we see when yep. in that weird, like, construct that he's, like, you know, that multiverse thing, he's walking around with seeing different ages of himself. Yep. And then he becomes this big thing in star space, child the star child then you would think okay that must be a higher order of consciousness that sure. is the next evolution of man and i'm sure some people when they see this movie for the very first time are thinking that but I think they're like oh that's the star child he's in higher order of consciousness no but i think the first time you watch this movie you hold on to the stuff that is easier to comprehend you understand the how story like that's pretty easy yeah, a, yeah. an ai that goes rogue and the humans have to fight and so like there's chunks of this movie that you're like I get it for sure, and then the rest is implanted as like, what the fuck? I think that, but I think that that's what makes the other stuff more frustrating. Interesting, because there is like a decent movie in the middle of this, like the the Hal the, the the discovery of the spaceship story, that whole arc with uh, with Frank Bowman or uh, Dave Bowman. That's that's a little that's a little sci-fi movie in itself. There are some long, boring shots, but that's a little sci-fi movie in itself. That could be a movie without. The other three sections. But I think though, like, how do you how do you simulate Not the, that I would the want awe that. of interstellar travel? Like, this is the best approximation that Stanley Kubrick yes. could imagine. Right. What it would be like to totally be some be somewhere incomprehensible. No, no, He's it, putting things on screen that shouldn't be on screen. Totally, I completely agree, and I love the 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 execution of it like that scene where the the scene where he's going through like interdimensional space or whatever and like the crazy lights are going and you know that's where the people that's where the acid people came to have that trip uh i think that's amazing and that's like a really like when i first watched this movie on my laptop as a university student <laughs> i was like tripping out my mood in my room not being on any drugs at all just kind of like have all the lights off and just yeah, like staring like, mm -hmm. at my laptop screen be like oh where am i going <laughs> you know like it's it's cool it's like, like that's a cool thing to put on screen for the first time i'm just saying i'm not i'm not trying to bash that element or the mysterious elements of the film i'm just saying that the fact that there is this mini movie in the middle that kind of makes sense makes the other parts of the movie harder to sit through when they are so long. Mm. Mm. If they were a bit shorter, I think that it would be a better movie overall. You want another character in there where before Dave goes through, like travels interdimensionally, 
the other character to go, hey, is that a wormhole? What's going <laughs> to happen when we go through that wormhole? Not necessarily. And then when they arrive, they're like, whoa, are we in some kind of like construct from your consciousness and memories? You know what? And like I, a fourth it's dimension? Even, it's not even that. Because that's like, what happens in Interstellar. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> Interstellar yeah. is too much. And especially Christopher Nolan loves to just explain everything uh, really, really fast so that it's not ex- actually explained because no one heard what you said. And the audio is really bad too. But um, no, I don't even necessarily want that in this movie. I just want, <laughs> I just want these these awe-inspiring bits to just be a bit shorter. That's I, it. I can see what you're saying a little bit. I feel like a a lot of this movie feels kind of disconnected, and the way yeah. that tonally there's stuff that's so grounded and stuff that's so out there, mm. and there's not really much to connect those two is kind of a little bit hard to enjoy, especially on the first couple watches. Yeah. But uh, you guys I, want you guys want more facts. Yeah, he sure. more Facts. random stuff. One of the uh, most iconic moments in this movie is when Moonwatcher is is using the tool, and uh, then eventually it goes up, and there's a, a sick match cut. So the bone is floating through the air because he's thrown it in the air, and then it switches. We've just traveled four million years into the future, and we're in space, and the bone is replaced by what looks like a satellite, but actually is a, a atomic bomb. Oh, and so they're actually, and you would only know that if you knew about the screenplay um, because there's this movie used to have a narrator there used to be narration Uh, you want to read it Riley what what do you mean I want you to read the narration for this part by the year 2001 overpopulation has replaced the problem of starvation but this was ominously offset by the absolute and utter perfection of the weapon (laughs) hundreds of giant bombs had been placed in perpetual orbit above the earth they were capable of they were capable of incinerating the entire Earth's surface from an altitude of 100 miles. <laughs> Imagine how bad this would be yeah, if this I was would. in the movie. But, I mean, Especially it, with that delivery. It does make some of the thematic stuff <clears throat> more clear. Like, it's like humans evolved by using weapons. And I think that this movie is trying to make the point that, like, we're evolving past weapons. Mm. And that's part of it. It's like, okay, the first monolith allowed us to turn something that was inanimate into a weapon. Right. And then, like, the the whole, like, the whole crisis of this film is... A thing we've like a technology we've created being used against us That's like right. it's a hell and so like with that narration it becomes easier to it, you're get actually there. hitting it so hard on the head because there's another paragraph that Riley didn't read uh, which it actually says French bomb narrator and if you look, <laughs> if you look they show us like seven or eight of these these bombs, and yeah, they actually yeah. have different flags on them. Oh, that's cool. you can see on the, the first one we see is a German one, and this says matters were further complicated by the presence of twenty seven nations in the nuclear club. <laughs> There had been no deliberate or accidental use of nuclear weapons since World War II, and some people felt secure in this knowledge. But to David's point, but to others, the situation seemed comparable to an airline with a perfect safety record in showing admirable care and skill, but no one expected it to last forever. Interesting. Mm. So that's the same thing with Hal, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that that that's also one of the cool things that I think the movie is pretty clear in its messaging about like the dangers of technology and and the the tendency of humans to kind of take things in our environment and turn them into not only tools but weapons Mm. that might turn on us Um, (laughs) the one thing about Hal that I thought was like kind of interesting is the fact that he from the get go he seems emotional like and they say that they say he's always oh, so good, he's so smart and so sophisticated that he can even uh, simulate human emotions. But I feel like I feel like people wouldn't want to make your computer seem emotional. I think that's a modern thing, though. I think like for a long yeah, time maybe. we thought assist, like computer assistants would have a personality, yeah. and it's only in the 2010s that we're like, I don't want my Siri to. Oh, like, it's not even back. it's not even that. It's the fact that like okay, we're going into space. This computer controls the ship. It controls everything. Do we want to allow this computer to even simulate emotions? It seems like not a good idea. We want the computer to be cold and logical and keep us alive. But I think I, I think it's going to kind of the theme of how like technology has turned against us, that we're over reliant on technology and that like on a bigger scale, like this technology represents the industrial revolution and like how yeah. we're like a capitalist society and how these machinations that have been created due to technology are turning against us. And even though they don't necessarily have a personality, yeah. they're 
like active. They're not just like, eh, it is what it is. Like they're controlled by people. And so they kind of have like this secondary personality. And I think that's what his personality is supposed to be is like. For sure. The, I, the what what is created by us. It's also yeah. creepy that it's uh, structured the same way as the human mind. You know how we have different parts of our brain that, with, that are different ages? Mm-hmm. Like you got your little lizard brain. And on top of that is your limbic, like mammalian yeah. brain. And on top of that is your like uh, frontal cortex. Right. And it's the same thing with Hal. They say we need to shut down his like conscious parts, but right. we need to keep running his like lizard brain that actually runs the ship and is in charge of breathing and digestion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I'm not saying I'm not saying that thematically it doesn't work in the movie or anything. Obviously, the reason why they made him emotional is so he could have this kind of like yeah. breakdown and have it more seem like he's a real character. Which he does. He's he's probably the most complex character in the whole movie. It's also terrifying though when he says things at the beginning like there's something I can't shake from my mind. Yeah, exactly. My mind? You have a mind? You have a sense of exactly. mind? Exactly, yeah. but that, that's what I'm saying. It, it makes it f- feel a little less realistic is what I'm saying, is because I feel like in real life we wouldn't want our uh, you know, life s- system supporting AIs to be emotional and yeah, be like, be I'm concerned about very it. Very separate. Yeah, I can't get it out of my mind. Yeah. Well, oh, that's a, a normal thing for a computer to say. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I agree. David, you're trying to say that uh, that's a 2021 watching. Like if someone watched that in 68, they, they yeah, wouldn't they'd think. Be like, they'd be so impressed that there is a computer that yeah. can do all these things. I think like, that's a valid point because I, yeah. they probably, you know, this is probably one of the first times where they're seeing a computer, a, a artificially intelligent computer uh Depicted on screen to this level of sophistication. Or... Star Trek did it first. That's... Well, sure, but I mean, like, <laughs> I'm kidding. Creepy did, voice, did though. The, yeah, I, I, voice. I haven't the seen the M5 computer in Star Trek was a computer meant to design or to control an entire starship, but it turned against the people. Oh no! But so did wait. it have the voice of Canadian Douglas Rain? It sure did. Who <laughs> recorded it all in one day in nine and a half hours, Was and no actually? one else on the film heard it until they screened that's it. So funny. None of the actors oh, knew. That's that's apparently, he had his he took his shoes off and put his feet on pillows so he'd have that more relaxed tone. That's actually oh, wow. great. I was actually yeah, because I think his performance is really good. I think that the 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 Hal doesn't come off as this stereotypical kind of like I am a robot like. So many people do robot voices and they think they have to do all of these dynamics because the yep. robot is trying to approximate human speech. And in this one, they're just kind of like, he's just down here the whole time. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Yeah, yeah like, It's a good choice, yeah. for sure. Uh, apparently, Kubrick was like a really kind of gentle director. Uh, there's a, an anecdote where he, in a way of like, <laughs> like wanting to just help you get to where you need to be like there was a an actor like not one of the main actors just like a side character came in for like one day of shooting and was tapping his foot when he was delivering his lines and it was making a sound that was getting caught in the audio and a lot of people would be like hey okay great but can you stop tapping your foot when you do it and instead (laughs) Kubrick just went up and put a blanket under his foot huh it was like yeah you can still tap your foot if that's what you need to do yeah right to, to, to do the, the line. Point. I think that's really... I think he is an incredible director in that way where he just kind of f- thinks differently than other people because you're right, most directors would be like, hey, just fucking stop. Mm. Um, but he was so concerned with this reality he was creating that he was willing to take the weird idiosyncrasies of these actors and work around that. Mm. There's, there's a lot of other stuff that he did and I have a, a list of... A particularly on The ab- Shining, I think is the worst one. There's a lot of abusive shit he did here. In and this like, just movie? Just asshole shit where I'm like, fuck this guy. So Before I guess we talk about not that, a can we just talk about other casting things? <laughs> no, maybe things? the people. Yeah, other casting things. Uh, apparently, like, the first person to speak in this movie at 25 minute mark the, is the passport girl. And... Well, actually, she's second. The first person is like just riding on the elevator with with Floyd. But that passport girl, they did three months of casting just for her, what? just for her part. Hundreds auditioned the for the first huh. one he talks to on the space station. Yeah. Wow. He's like, oh, I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah. Three no, months. No, I've seen in a while. That's it. You got the part. That casting director <laughs> must have been so frustrated. I like, saw an interview with the woman who was the the flight attendant, the one who snatches the pen, and uh, she said that when she interviewed or auditioned, uh, she was high. Because she had just gotten like a tooth removed or some oh. kind of oral <laughs> surgery. Yeah, yeah. And so she was like kind of woozy. And that's what got her the part. Oh, because so she, funny. you Gosh. can see when she's walking to go and get that pen, she kind of stumbles a bit. <laughs> they were Did like, they like yeah. get her to smoke weed before. <laughs> like. Also, that's such a funny man that the, like, a lot of the technology, a lot of the space technology we see is like, seems pretty realistic, you know, like the, the, the meals and whatnot. But other parts are like, <laughs> the velcro shoes and stuff is just kind of silly like obviously like why would you want if there's no gravity 
Why would you want Velcro shoes? This is what I'm telling you from before, because they're trying to assimilate space to yeah. Earth ways. Yeah, they're not, they're not living in space age. They're bringing Earth to space. Yes. Yeah, I know, but I don't know. I guess, Plus, I, you get to do <laughs> kick-ass shots like I guess, that. Yeah. I guess by this point, if they're they have these like space liners where it's basically just like a plane, but it's in space, and you like sit in the flight stewardess brings you food and stuff. Um, I guess if they're like to that point in space exploration and space technology, but they haven't figured out artificial gravity, it's like okay, I guess we got to move, we got to walk. At the same time, I like I don't know. It's I, a simple solution. Yeah, it, just seems, it like, just seems goofy because I haven't seen fair. any other sci-fi movie that has, has said. And how will we live on the spaceships? Velcro shoes. <laughs> I, I think, know. though, that like it that's, seems silly. it's more about the ambition that he had, where like he wanted to create this totally oh, to- whole full reality. Because yeah. like it's a lot easier to be like, yep, the artificial gravity's kicking in, like everything's normal, right? Uh, and it's a lot more complicated to do this stuff. And I want to yeah. talk about some of the special effects, like how they did it. Yeah, like that. Do uh, you know, we've all seen the Incep- in Inception. There's that hallway fight that actually has the same kind of mechanism. In that episode, we explained how that mechanism worked a bit, but. Th- that the inception of that shot is this movie where you see this the flight attendant walk like clockwise up the wall yeah and it's the same deal where she's actually just walking on the spot and the camera and the foreground are rotating yeah and they do kind of the same thing when uh he's jogging around the spaceship and they're like the camera is stationary but it the whole the whole thing is rotating and it's huge it was like 40 feet diameter yeah uh, yeah they spent like millions of dollars on that thing in like a year building it yeah and apparently it was super dangerous to be around like you had to wear a hard hat because like lights would just explode because they they're old lights they're super hot oh, and they just weren't meant to be upside down so the glass would oh just explode gosh. all of a sudden oh. and so yeah I thought that was really see this interesting. is this is one of the things though where I think the holds up conversation comes back because on the one end I watch this and I'm like whoa this is really good for 1968 but on the other hand I'm like that that flight stewardess is taking really 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 yeah. tiny steps and yeah, she's yeah. clearly just going super slow in order to keep up with the rotating thing the illusion doesn't quite hold yeah, up yeah it doesn't quite hold up but at the same time you know i am impressed on the behalf of the people in the theater in 1968 i even like when she grabs the floating pen you're like how is that pen floating right how does she snap it i was it? wondering how you they know did how that? they do that shot how they used newly invented double-sided tape and stuck it to a big pane of glass. And there's just <gasps> two dudes no! holding a pane of glass, what? moving it around to make it look like the pen's floating. That... And then she just goes up and she unsticks it from the pa- the pane of glass. That's all and it is. It looks That's awesome. really cool. Yeah, it looks I never, ex- I would have never expected. You can that. kind of tell when she grabs it that there's some kind of resistance. Like yeah. she looks like she plucks it off yeah. of something. It looks like it's like in jelly or something. Yeah, she should have like given it a little twist or something, but. And then, yeah. so, like, when he's sleeping on the in his seat and his arms are just kind of floating, was that just him, like, doing that? Or did they have, like, a string? <laughs> no, they went to space. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, did they have those planes where where you could, like, yet, dive and do zero G? I don't think so. I think that was later. But even the, the little things, like the monkey suits, like, there's a story that the reason why they didn't win the Oscar for the monkey suits is that too many people thought they were just real monkeys. Oh, wow. Uh, and, like, it, they do such brilliant things. Like, Wait, I, what? Yo, they didn't the f- win an Oscar for it because people thought, thought they were real monkeys? Yep. They look that- pretty... They're hit or miss. Sometimes they look yeah. really damn good, and sometimes you're like, okay, that's a dude. I think they're, what yeah. really goes to sell them, though, is the inclusion of real animals. Like, there's the tape right. layers that help sell it, but then the baby monkeys as well. Like, mm-hmm. it just... Like, a baby monkey moves in a certain way, and yeah. then your brain is like, monkey, 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 monkey. And no, they also honestly. have those prosthetics. Like, they elongate their arms by having... Yeah hands that are go beyond their hands and yeah. the same with the mouth yeah. they have like these robotic mouths that you can control with yeah. your tongue and stuff the animato- a- animatronics really on their faces was like pretty good i was like I-, I wrote that this is pretty lame by by modern standards but i imagine this was really good for 1968 the actors inside are all mimes oh and really they, yeah and they had to have really thin arms oh, so that yeah. apparently the main one was a huge drug addict like he was like the apparently at the time the UK had like legal drug addict status where they would give you heroin and cocaine and apparently he would do cocaine and heroin every day seven times a day and on top of that if you needed more he would do crystal meth and apparently like he kept it kept it hidden from everybody but Kubrick found out at one point and he was like okay cool tell me about it like tell me what it feels like yeah yeah wow and so tell me what it feels like there's, to get inside with your ape side man. <laughs> there's a dead zebra in one of those scenes and mm. it's actually just a dead horse that they painted. <laughs> no. Seriously, and it stunk on the set. Where did they get it? What? Why, why would they bring on a dead horse? Uh, did they, they didn't have a dead zebra. Yeah, but why would they just... <laughs> I guess because if you had a horse lie down, it would be breathing, and you could tell. Yeah. 
Why did you just like well, they, make you? They who painted just make, it? How long did that take? Yeah. <laughs> did they? Hopefully, they didn't kill that horse. They just bought a dead horse. Oh, I'm sure they just bought yeah, a dead yeah. horse. I've, I've, <laughs> where can you buy a dead horse these days? <laughs> <laughs> the glue factory. I don't know. Oh, I got a guy. I got a dead horse guy. <laughs> I was wondering for those shots where the tapir, like where they they learn how to kill the tapirs with a bone or whatever, and then it shows tapirs collapsing, and I was like, oh man, this is back in 1968. People were savages back then, you know, like they <laughs> might, might have just killed these tapirs, but no, they yeah, use tranquilizer okay. darts. Yeah. Oh, speaking of savage, the music in this movie, obviously oh. iconic. Yeah. Hearing the blade, the blue Danube when things yes. are flying in space is awesome. Mm -hmm. That they did the thing where which is very common even today, where you, when you're making a movie or editing a movie, you just have um, guide pieces of music mm. that you intend to replace. Right. And you give those guide pieces to the composer, and it's like, this is what I'm thinking. Yeah. Um, so they did that, and then Kubrick was unhappy with the score that had been composed. And then so they just used the guide pieces. Yeah. And then he justifies it later being like, why would you try to write new music when you have like hundreds of years in this tradition that like you're not going to top yeah. the survivor bias of like, the best music from yeah. the past, right? Mm. But anyway, the composer that they hired didn't find out that they didn't oh. use his score until the, the premiere. Oh, what? what an asshole. That's savage. Oh, dang, yeah, dude. Kubrick was mean to you people You thought like you were going to like be a part of this whole yeah. societal transformation, being yeah. part of this work? Yeah, he made promises to Arthur Clarke because they were writing the book and the movie at the same time that like right. they would work, work on it and like release things together. Uh, and he totally fucked over Arthur Clark by like moving ahead with with the movie stuff and like kind of pushing that to the side. Oh, really? And Arthur Clark needed was poor. He needed money, and he like kept begging Kubrick, like, "Please let me like release this part. Let me do this. Like, let's work huh. on this." And Clark Kubrick was like, "Sorry, movie first. So that's really interesting. Because well, I, they, they co-wrote the screenplay. Yeah. Like, so Arthur yeah. C. Clark was on the set the whole I time. I thought I thought for a while that uh, 2001: Space Odyssey was based off a book, but yeah, it turns out that it was there was a book. But it was released at the, well. It was There's like a story the called the uh, the Sentry, and that's what Sentinel. The Sentinel. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what the one part of the movie is. Right. Mm. Right. But the Hal. Yeah, that's right. You know the uh, monoliths. The, the monoliths were going to be like tetrahedrons at first, like pyramid looking. Oh yeah. But they don't look uh, big or imposing. <laughs> They're just little tiny pyramids. They, yeah, I saw like a mock-up. It's like <laughs> they just look stupid. Yeah. The monolith is like. It's great because it's like incomprehensible. Why, why is it standing up? Like it should yeah. be on its side. Like there's like the, a weird supernatural thing about that. Oh, I love it. Yeah. yeah. I love They're how just it's made of wood. They're just painted oh, really? by it wood. It looks great. Yeah. It looks great. It, Guys, it, it almost looks like. So were those real objects? Yeah. Because there are so many shots where they look as if they just kind of superimposed it on. Especially floating in space. Like it's a matte painting or something. And when they're floating in space, they look like they're, like they're not real. Like they're CG or something right. sometimes. But you're telling but me must, that, that that's. that's imposed after though like it's that's all comp like film comp. no they actually went and put it in space <laughs> hell yeah with the space baby <laughs> with the, with the star, space monkey they got the star yeah. child to go grab it and then yeah. yeah uh back to one star child <laughs> <laughs> are uh are is are spaceships phallic by nature does dude, every spaceship dude, look like a I, penis thank you for bringing this up <laughs> because how like man when they first reveal the design of discovery one which is the big giant one going to jupiter i'm just like Wait a second. <laughs> Got like two this balls. Looks, this looks like a... <laughs> Spaceships are penises. It Space it looks stations like are vaginas. Oh, oh, thank you. Okay. All right, moving on. <laughs> Do you think that there's like a, a thematic side to that? Like it's like the invasion, like invasive thing, like masculine, like toxic masculinity that this you could is, tie into it? I or doubt is it that just the, the I doubt that the theme was toxic masculinity in 1968. But I, I'm glad you brought this up because um, there is a whole... Uh, interpretation of this movie called the conception allegory oh. and that and the uh, it, it involves that's why the spaceship looks like a sperm because yep. kind of the general interpretation is uh, humanity is kind of developing as a species and once it becomes mature it heads out into the into space to blow its load on the blow universe its load into the monoliths <laughs> and the monoliths are i guess it's like impregnating the monoliths and that's why the star child is quote unquote born and so then this like new form of life is you know oh this actually lines up with it, it originally you know how uh, it's actually pretty abs abstract or like uh, obscure what happens when dave goes to infinity he's just you, sh you see the ship and then you just see the colors like shooting at the yeah. screen yeah it, like, nothing really he doesn't go into a wormhole yeah. or anything no originally what it was gonna be was a monolith shaped hole in jupiter right. that he would fly into oh. and then that didn't look right yeah. but that would have fit right with what you're saying well, apparently huh. apparently in the official narrative or whatever he's going into the monolith 
but we don't the the movie doesn't explicitly kind of give you that no. yeah well after they couldn't do the jupiter whole thing then they did mock-ups where he actually went into the monolith uh-huh. so he, he was going toward the monolith and it was like a mirrored surface you could see right. the ship coming toward itself kind of and then just disappeared into like it that black. didn't look right either nice. yeah. and then they went to using the uh, uh what's it called slit lens yeah. oh yeah yeah where they had the long shutter and the thing yeah wait on. do can you do a brief description of how they did that uh, I'm not 100% sure, but basically what I understand is that it's like a basically a cardboard thing that they put a slit in and they have the shutter open for really long exposure. So that means that like everything's kind of smeary and then uh-huh. they had like optical effects shine through that slit with the long exposures and then they like m- physically moved either the you're, camera you're or the pr- You're pretty right on. So the back wall of it is a bunch of lights coming out. Okay. And then there's the, uh, a black thing with a slit in it. Yep. So light travels through that. Then there's a track with the camera on it and the tr- the camera moves toward the slit on the track. And then because it's a long exposure uh, for non-camera people, it's like you ever seen those photos of cars on the highway, but the, the, all the light streaks, like they make this, mm-hmm. this big long red streaks and that's a car. Uh, yeah. It's just that. So, and you and when you're moving the camera forward, yeah. it streaks it out. Oh, very and then they could rotate the lens because at first uh, the colors kind of come out from the vertical sl- slit yeah. and then there's a... a following ones that are that are uh, horizontal yeah, and then i think the rest was like ink that they did and then they just like put use the negative color the oh yeah they color. show a bunch of that are like they're actually similar to what we, they did in the fountain where it's mm. it's like ink or it's a chemical reaction and kubrick just did that in his apartment like huh. in a dark room and then there's one more they're they're like uh, aerial shots of landscapes you know it's like basically they were in a helicopter flying over like a uh, monument valley or whatever and what they do there is they you just split the film out into its component parts so there's like a black and white image and then like a red one a green one and a blue one and then you invert colors on some of them and put them back together and that's when you get those funky like oh all the sand is green yeah, yeah, yeah i think they should just remove those i don't get it because he's like flying through space and it's like a it's just a whole different plane of existence that's not terrestrial at all, then why am I seeing a planet? Yeah, it's And even confusing. if he's going into Jupiter, that's not a terrestrial planet. It's a gas giant. It just doesn't make any sense. This movie needs George Lucas to go back and make a director's cut. <laughs> 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 yeah, that, that one shot in that whole sequence is too confusing. Take mm-hmm. it out. More CG animals. It's like the whole entire thing is so confusing, it's supposed to like expand your mind. What did you guys think of when they first wake up on the Discovery uh, and they're watching a newsreel of themselves, and it's just yeah. like straight exposition. They didn't just wake up. Okay. They've always been, they were awake from the launch. Oh, it's the other but, ones. That, okay. But yeah, it's like these guys recorded this interview previously. Now it's airing, and they've edited out the seven minutes like time it takes between responses. Yeah. And I, I agree with you. Okay, I don't care that it's just exposition. Yeah. That kind of works for me, but I don't buy that these guys would sit in silence watching the footage of them. 100%. Wouldn't they comment on, like, yeah. oh, my hair oh, sucked dude. that yeah, day yeah, or, yeah. or something? Totally. I, I also don't buy the questions. Like, they say that they edited out the time. Like, it takes seven yeah. minutes to respond. But the first few things that are said in that video are, is, like, how are you guys doing? Fine, thanks. Great. But, <laughs> like, there's yeah. no way you're going to wait seven minutes and say, fine, thanks, and then wait seven minutes again. They yeah. would have said, I'm great. This is what's happening. In the lo- they yeah. would have given like a big paragraph answer. Yeah. This doesn't make any sense. I mean, whatever. I just, I find it's a nitpick. Yeah. yeah. I feel like that whole idea is just kind of like sloppy. I feel like that whole scene is kind of sloppy. Like having a newsreel exposition scene in this crazy sci fi movie feels like he didn't really want to think of a better way of giving this exposition. It's just so, I don't know. It, it did bother me. It was just so exposition y. It was like, here's the computer. Here's how it works. Here's these people. Here's their situation. And it yeah. was like a newsreel thing, which is like really basic well i don't know it just bothered I, me i think that it particularly feels awkward because normally that's the type of exposition that we would get early in the movie mm. but because this is like a four <laughs> four what do you call that four three, hour movie four pod <laughs> feels like four hours so there there are four distinct sections of this movie and the first two are completely well largely unrelated to the other well not unrelated that's the wrong word but you know what i mean there's these distinct structures these distinct distinct pods and uh you know we don't we can't get that exposition early in the movie because we're not talking about it yet so i think that's probably why it also feels weird (laughs) yeah and also by that same token he doesn't have a whole movie to like he doesn't have time to that's fair it has to be kind of dense Although he spends, he allocates his time differently. That's exactly, that's, <laughs> ah! I mean, I I don't want to belabor the point, but like, it's not dense. Like, it, like the movie is dense in, in the fact that it has, it feels heavy with meaning. You know, it feels like it, it, it invites interpretation. 
because everything that happens, you're just like, what's going on? What does that mean? What's going on? Um, but it's not dense. It's so funny. Uh, what's the opposite of dense? <laughs> sparse. Di- sparse. There's just so many just sections of nothing. But Riley, did you see the scene where the sun and the planet align and it looks like a nipple? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have another nitpick that fits into the conception yeah. of Harry pretty well. I like the part when Hal won't let Dave back on the ship, and then Dave's like, "Fine, I'm going to go through this other way," and he just tells him, and then Hal's like, "That's going to be hard without your helmet," and he's like, "Fuck, okay, well I have no choice." So he goes to do it. Yeah. He, he lines up the ship out like a budding the, the discovery, and then he is ready to shoot himself into the airlock. Yeah, and he goes head first. <laughs> that always. It bothers me. Just yeah. Feet first, man. He sh- and then he shoots it yeah. into the vacuum of the airlock and hits his head. Honestly, <laughs> like, honestly, I took a full point off for that. <laughs> well, and like it's a, <laughs> it's a little bit funny because he he should get pulled into the hole, but like, you can see that the wire pulls him to the side. Yeah. Uh, and that bothered me a tiny bit. Mm. Point zero zero one point. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. Are we doing nitpicks? Yeah, I'm just I'll doing do it. it. We're well, doing it all right now. Did, okay. did you notice the uh, cross that the planets and the monolith make at one point? Oh, no. Conception, dog. What? Immaculate. Cross? <laughs> conception? Immaculate conception. <laughs> well, okay. Well, that's that's an interesting point because um, a lot of people watch this movie and they're like, oh, there makes me, there's a, like a religious, it's almost like a religious feeling. For sure. In terms of like the sense of wonder and awe that it's trying to elicit in you, right? And uh, he has said, I think he, well, I have a quote, I have a quote. He, he's Kubrick has said at various times throughout his career that he either like would believe in the idea of a god if by god you mean like other beings that developed out elsewhere in the universe and have ascended to this kind of like star child level of of intelligence and ability um and then at other times he's just been like the god the idea of god is absurd but i think what is really cool about this movie is that he like i, I think that there is a religious interpretation to be had here, but I like his view of the idea of the infinite uh, in that it's just like, we can't know. It's something, and that's why I think I push back a little bit on the idea that like, oh, well, it's definitely aliens who created this monolith and placed it there and blah, 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 you know? I think that his intention, the way that I read it is is that this is more of a sort of, it's just a mystery and, and the monolith is supposed to represent everything that humans attempt to grasp and can't. Well, I'll tell you this. Mm. From the beginning of production on this movie, they were trying to have an alien on the screen. And I'm they, so glad when, they did. When Dave goes to that, you know, the little house that he walks around at the end, yeah. there's yeah. gonna be a, an alien there who like gave him a tour. Well, like a little guy? We don't, uh, don't like, they had lots of different mock-ups, like uh, a kind of a bipedal being that was just comprised of, or composed of dots. Yeah. Versus like just a floating light. They yeah. just they tried a million things and none of it really well, worked. Yeah, according to Kubrick's interpretation, he's been taken in, taken in by the celestial beings, and like he's basically there for study. Like this is like a zoo, right. sure. and they did their best to do like a human environment for him. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they're elevating him to space child, and then sending him back to Earth to elevate. We're gonna the other keep people. you here until you turn into a star child. I think it was they more were for feeding study. Him, they were feeding uh, him special And it was like the, the way that time... To the, <laughs> he was there for like as long as it took to age, but to him, it felt like nothing. It was like uh, these flashes of time. Yeah, it's uh, just like... It's like a, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Nice, dude. Uh, on the ending, Kubrick said, uh, this is like an area I prefer not to discuss because it's highly subjective and it'll differ from viewer to viewer. In this sense, the film becomes anything the viewer sees in it. If, if the film stirs the emotions and penetrates the subconscious of the viewer, if it stimulates... However, inchoately, their mythological and religious <laughs> yearnings and impulses, then it has succeeded. Right on. I right heard on. a lot of words there that remind me of conception. <laughs> <laughs> I just yearnings. can't stop thinking of dicks right now. I, I can't ever <laughs> stop thinking about dicks. Can we um, talk about how abusive of an asshole Kubrick is for if a you, bit? If we must. Okay, wait, real quick. Just last thing about the aliens yeah. thing, because I think that... I think that it makes sense to me that in, in an early point in the creative process, they were kind of like exploring those ideas. But I think the fact that they kind of ended it on It wasn't this, even early though, like throughout a lot of it. Throughout like the actual production of yes, the movie? there's times where they're going to look like big insects. <laughs> That's fucked. All right, never mind. <laughs> Continue. Kubrick. Kubrick's an, an asshole. He's a brilliant man. And like if, if I could do one thing in my life that is as important as any one of his movies, I'd be very happy. But I think that we mytholo- mythologize his abuse 
the same way that we mythologize uh, method actors and the, the, the pain they inflict on those around them. Uh, in the same way that we're like, wow, Shelley Duvall's performance is so good because Kubrick like yelled at her and like made her like miserable. And it's like real misery you see on screen. I'm like, fuck that guy. That's a fucking asshole movie. I guess yelling at and women this, is the way. Yeah, like <laughs> this, the stunt guy <laughs> asked, performance. The stunt guy asked for a second cable uh, so that it'd be more safe. And he was like, no, fuck you. Uh, made him use one cable and it broke. Whoa. Uh, he asked for well, brief- did he get hurt? He got hurt. Did he die? No. Well, shut up then. <laughs> no, okay. He, uh, <laughs> he he uh, wanted breathing holes in the mask because th- there was no ventilation. And so he was like constantly on the verge of passing out. Cooper said no. Is this when um, there's a shot of it's like um, Dave is scooping up the body of his dead comrade. I'm not sure. And he drives toward it. And in the movie, it's kind of a pretty gentle pace that the ship goes and bumps into the body and collects it. But they actually shot it way faster. Right. And then it slowed down. It's the definitely, footage yeah, you see. Motion. And apparently they did that a lot of times and it hurt. I believe it. Mm. But uh, so he was on the constant verge of passing out. And at one point he did pass out on a cable and it was like a big issue. Uh, and while he was passed out, Kubrick knew he was in trouble and fled for days. What? He, they had to pause production for days because this guy was, a, uh, I think, a South African mercenary that had turned into a stunt guy and was like pissed. He was fucking pissed. Holy shit. Uh, and then we already talked about how he kind of fucked over Clark and Clark was mad mad at Kubrick about it. But then here's the thing that's like such a small thing, but I'm like, this goes to perfectly exemplify why I have such a like <sighs> about uh, Kubrick. What is that? Wait, they, what, what is that? Ugh, what, is that? <sighs> what does that mean? You have this, such dislike. a dislike. Okay. Uh, as a human. Great. He's an incredible filmmaker. It's <laughs> super important. And like, if I saw him, I would hit him. <laughs> just say it. Just say it. Um, so when they were scouting to find stuff for the uh, Dawn of Man er- stuff, they found trees in Namibia that they liked. And they're like, hey, can we take these? They were told no. And he told his crew, go in darkness, cut them down. We're oh. taking them. He cut them down, took them, brought them back to his set. They and then he's like, they're too small. <laughs> and he had his team make new ones that were fake anyway. No. And I'm like, Stanley Kubrick, you suck. And they were an endangered <laughs> tree. And like, ugh. David, you can't so stand in the him. way of art. That's, that's my, my question, though, is what is the line that's worth it? Like, is 2001 worth these things, maybe it's like such a seminal word. I guess, yeah. But what is the line? I think I'm kind of with you. Where you know, obviously there are there are savants that exist, and they create something amazing, and it's like, whoa, we should uh, you know revere this work. But at the same time, I do agree with you. I think that that like works like this uh, are are elevated and put on a pedestal because they're so dense and weird, and like we haven't seen something like this before, and it's open to interpretation. It's abstract, and we're like, oh, he's a genius. Yeah. But I think that's what I mean when I kind of like I went there and now I've come back to the other side of the spectrum where I'm like that that something being abstract and, and groundbreaking isn't in itself something to be praised. I think that a movie has to have all of these parts. And I think the fact that Kubrick like did these things, as you say, points to the fact that he valued the the other end of the spectrum yeah. most. Yeah. He's like, it's most important that I create this groundbreaking, weird yeah. thing that will make people think, and everything else is in service to that. Totally. My, my, I think I have a huge problem, too, with like people admiring those things that he did. Like, See what he's willing to sacrifice for this movie. See the price he's willing to pay. Oh, the thing I forgot was when the leopard is on set, everyone was really scared because oh, when they yeah. first brought it out, it attacked the wrong person. It was uh, supposed to attack true. the trainer and it attract the act, attack the actor. He had a one-man cage built for himself and nobody else. Wait, what what an you, ass- Well, around the camera. Him and the camera. That's it. What? Yeah. <laughs> what an asshole. What do you mean? But I th- I think That's insane. Yeah, my 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 question is like why why do people take these things as a good thing instead of like criticizing him for it? Cuz like okay, we, wait, we who, praise Kubrick. But who's taking those things as Who's not criti- criticizing him for that? Who's saying like, "Well, he's a visionary. He deserves the cage." <laughs> Everyone <laughs> else maybe sucks. not that one. That was well, so no, clearly but things like an process, asshole. like doing so many takes, or the way you treat an actor during the shoot, beca- oh, yeah. all in the in the pursuit yeah. of like getting them to totally. react a certain not way. Not being willing mm-hmm. to compromise by making breathing holes for the actor because like he's so intent on the the spacesuit being realistic. Right. Right. Why? Why is that stuff praised? Uh. People want to buy into the movie. People want to buy into this other reality, I guess. Definitely. I think that there's like a cult of personality that comes, comes along with these type of things. I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of what I was saying. Like, James, how do you feel about it? Well, they're all on a line, right? Because you'll have a story 
uh, he- here's a little anecdote. All the still photography that shown at the beginning of the movie, all the landscapes, and actually those are the same backdrops they projected behind the monkeys. Those are all still photographer shots in Africa. And Kubrick did not like flying, even though he had a pilot's license. He <laughs> So he didn't go to Africa. So he corresponded with all those photographers over the phone. And they would send him the the photos um, and he would describe what he wanted to them. Like he described a grid, like an X and Y axis grid where he was like, okay, you've got in like, so there's numbers on the bottom and like letters on the other axis. Mm-hmm. So in, in a two, you've, you've got the peak of this mountain. Can we get that in J four? Sure. And he would like correspond with them to get this like, exact <laughs> thing he wanted. And you hear a story like that and you're like, wow, that That's person's cool. like very intelligent and dedicated and, and so intentional. Yeah. And that's somewhere on this line, on this like spectrum. So then you just step up to other parts of their process that also, you know, there are means to an end, but they have casualties and everyone just has like a different line of what yeah. they think is cool. Yeah, that's fair. And it is a personal thing. And like if people are OK being treated by Stanley Kubrick that way, then it's like, yeah, that's like you're making better movies, arguably, for these reasons. Yeah, I, I think that I think that the this this worship of the director of the super, super artsy, really good director, I think um, has to depend on their work. Like, I think their work has to speak for itself. And I think that Kubrick has made a lot of really good stuff. But I think this movie in particular, uh, man, I just, you know, like, I, at the end of the day, I think that it is art. It's definitely art, you know? Mm. I'll say that. For sure. It makes you think. And if it doesn't make you think, doesn't think you think, if it doesn't make you think, then you're watching it wrong. You're not, your brain isn't on. Like, it, there are lots here to think about. But as an experience, it's not that great. I think, and I think that at the end of the day, I'm not going to, like, fall at Kubrick's feet for making something that, like, it, it's basically <laughs> it's basically like somebody drawing something and then be like, let me show this to you, and then placing you in the seat and not letting you leave as they, like, show you every little tiny thing about it. And you're like, hey, I why don't you just let me watch like look at it on my own time and figure it out for myself i don't know i think i it, mean it's a weird analogy I kubrick know. has never been a director super interested in like the emotion of film i find he's interested in like the intelligent side and like the the impact uh like james cameron said about 2001 he's like it's an amazing movie but it has no emotional balls no and i'm like none yeah. at all and i mean like other movies like the shining there's a, yeah there's a feeling there's a tension there's I was a, gonna come back with that because um, like fear is an emotion and yeah like De- shining was definitely but i think there, he, but. he never really was interested in like the human experience it was like always about like saying something through film not about like capturing humans doing stuff i think it's i wouldn't say they're without emotion i just think it's about when the emotion hits you mm. i feel like i'm gonna be thinking about maybe they're just more cerebral but his movies, you, you turn the movie off or you walk out of the theater and it stays with you. Where there's mm-hmm. other movies where it's during the ride That's in the fair. chair that, yeah, you're really that it's hitting you, right? The thumbs up. Okay, yeah. Because that makes me make, makes me want to bring up something that we've talked about in previous podcasts before, which is I think that this movie requires multiple viewings in order to start to make sense of it. Like I think that someone who watches it for the very first time and walks out of the, th- well, you're not seeing it in a theater anymore, but but walks away from the screen being like, yeah, that made me feel really good. I think I understood what was going on there. Like, I don't, I think that's a rare occurrence. And I think that this is definitely one of those movies you have to watch multiple times. But at the same time, I think that having to watch a movie multiple times in order to fully understand it or in order to get what it's saying is a huge weakness. I, I have, I take off points for that. But I don't think this movie is that, it's not like a David uh, Lynch movie or something where you're just like, what the fuck is that? Like, I, I, I <laughs> yeah. think this is like... You don't think this is a movie where you're like, what the fuck is that? No, I think it's like, it's comprehensible. Like, maybe by the time the credits roll, you haven't had time to be like, to digest what this Star Child thing is. Yeah. But like I said, if you just like sit there while the credits, like before the credits end, you can be like, oh, I guess he's smarter now and that's what that looks like. I guess that's the next... That's I, don't the ne- th- I don't think most people are seeing this movie and being like, he's an embryo. That means he's smarter. Like we, okay. I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a takeaway that most people are taking away the first time they see this movie. I mean, it's all there. Like, he, well, it's he, all there when you look tr- into it. Well, he, you're watching the movie. You spent ten minutes with him, like traveling through, like all this lights coming at you, right? So you have yeah. ten minutes to think about what is happening. I bet he's traveling interdimensionally or something. Sure. Like, and then you have like ten minutes of him walking around some weird house, seeing different versions of himself. Yeah. So that's where it's like 
you might be like, what the hell is going exactly. on? But that's part, that combined with the star child thing, it's like, okay, I guess that's just like a different plane of existence that we can understand right now. I, I think I'll agree with you that like a very intellectual person might watch this movie and kind of come to that conclusion the first I'm talking about the first time I know time you are, but what it. I'm saying is there's evidence for that conclusion because you know the monkeys get smarter from the first one I well, know there's yeah. evidence that's what I'm saying though when you go back and think about it okay whatever we can argue about this all day like <laughs> I, I get what you're saying I'm just saying as a ride there's what, a reason everyone walked out of the theater in 1968 think, being like that was shit I think though okay. this this is a movie that straddles like art house and mainstream and that's one of its big successes is that yeah. like it made people that don't normally watch this kind of movie watch it and like even now people that are like I like movies watch this and they're like what Right, but that's uh, that's not the weirdest movie that's out there. Like, no, of course, like not. you said, David Lynch. Like, watch Eraserhead and be like, the fuck no, did no, I just watch? Totally, totally. And I, I, I will give you that this isn't the most wild movie there ever is. I'm just saying that it, it, it gets so close to being a like coherent narrative that it's frustrating that the only way it becomes actually coherent is upon reflection and or further watching. I don't know if it, if more viewings is what you need or if you just need to talk about it with more people. Or like sure, it, yeah. If you, if you just watch it repeatedly, you might just be confused again and again. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I don't know. Do you want Inst- more facts? Sure. All the breathing. There's a lot of breathing. I love that. I love the soundscape. All the breathing is Stanley Kubrick himself. Huh. Uh, what's sweet about it? You actually touched on this earlier, David, which is... You hear all this breathing. You get kind of almost so used to it. And then when um, not not Dave, the other guy is killed, the breathing stops. And then you're just in this like terrifying silence of space and then the, the vacancy of that death. Oh, interesting. When pool is like in thrown floating through space yeah, in his tube. Yeah, just yeah. You just, uh, he's breathing and at some point it stops. Yeah, his air tube is severed. Oh, okay. There's no more breathing. I didn't really know. You cannot that. breathe. Yeah. Well, I, I figured as soon as I saw his, his tube severed, I'm like, oh, he's dead. Yeah, he was. Yeah, <laughs> he yeah. was basically dead. It's like, oh, okay, you're going to go get his body. I don't know. That seems kind of weird. I'm like, you know that the AI is trying to kill you, so you're going to leave the spaceship when this guy's probably dead? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's a, f- a few problems there in terms of why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, can but... I Wait, can I say something? Is yeah. That, are we doing nitpicks? Yeah. Sort of. Uh, <laughs> how, so, okay, listen. Hal can clearly see them talking through the window, right? And they know they they're looking out there. They look at him a couple times. They're like, "Oh, there he is." Yeah. And they know that's how Hal sees them. So like, all they had to do in order for him not to read their lips was not rotate the pod. Yeah, because they intentionally turn it back. They to face intentionally him. rotate the pod. <laughs> so dumb. In order to have. But here's the deal. This is like I view this as not a failure of the characters. Where it's like, "Oh, these characters are so dumb. Why didn't they do that?" Like, I'm, I think there's a failure of 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 the film because you could have that shot just by having the pod facing the other way already. Yeah. And then they just exactly. like, open the pod, uh, Hal, and they he, get in. Because they walk up to it, they're like, rotate it, yeah. open it, rotate it again. Rotate it again. They should have just walked up and it was facing the correct way. They just say, open it, they get in, yeah. and that's yeah. it. Yeah. That would have been better. I that, thought the same thing. That really frustrates me. Anyways, that's all I had to say about that. <laughs> did, you guys, <laughs> did you guys know that uh, Stanley Kubrick tried to take out alien insurance? What is what? Because uh, I think, what was the, the thing called? The uh, Mariner 4 was just passing Mars, and he was afraid that, like, we would actually discover alien life. And so he wanted to get insurance for the movie in case like he got everything totally wrong about aliens and space <laughs> uh, that he tried to take out insurance. Fortunately or unfortunately, he was not <laughs> able to get it. Saved his money. But oh my yeah, God. there's so no, there's almost no remaining uh, replicas or, or any of the sets, the miniatures, any too, of the yeah. miniatures, they're all gone. He didn't want anyone to use them in other movies. Yeah. So a lot of them were destroyed. And then, but there's one that was found recently. It's the space station one. What is that called? Orion or um, doesn't matter. The big station station one, the circle one, was found in a field. It's the Hilton or something. I think. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Hilton space station. <laughs> no, it's the Days Inn. So what happened? No, was, it's, it was, there was a sign. It's the oh. Overlook. Yeah, I know what you're saying, but okay, that's not sure. what it's called. It's not Clavius. That's on the moon. Um, so what happened when the movie wrapped? Everything went to a storage container that was like paid for by MGM. But then MGM like went in, out of business. It like didn't. It changed hands a bunch of times, and anyway, at a certain point, Kubrick was called by a storage company that was like, are you going to pay? And he was like, no. So then they just dumped everything. And then that, someone, a photographer, like came up upon this in a field, and I think it's like it, it, in a museum somewhere now. Yeah, I saw, oh, no, I a teacher it... was using it. Wow. Or maybe that's a different model, but there was a teacher who had a, one of, a big model that was like six feet Oh, one of the yeah, I saw that it sold recently for like three hundred fifty thousand dollars. I'm like, I'm like, that's it. 
<laughs> I thought I would have thought more. Apparently, the space station was just called Space Station V or vi- or five. I'm not I don't V. Know. I that works I... with our conception story. Ah, <laughs> ah, I told you stations are V's. <laughs> um, what do you guys think about? That? Did did this make you think at all um, when they're traveling on like the lunar surface in that little craft towards the crater where the monolith? Where they is. have the sandwiches. They have the sandwiches, but as they're kind of like looking at these things, they're kind of. Um, they're having coffee and stuff, and they're having like a casual conversation about how long ago it was buried. It's like it seems to have been deliberately buried, and the guy's like, "Deliberately buried? Oh, huh, huh. well, <laughs> want some coffee? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, so the only thing we know for sure is that four million it was bl- uh, buried four million years ago. Oh, interesting. He's like, "Watch out! This coffee's hot." It's like, <laughs> like if I, I feel like if this was a modern movie, they'd be like, four million years? What? Like, we well, yeah, gotta struggle with the ramifications of." What this means, like maybe they've already all done all that off screen, but like, I don't know. It was just kind of a weird, they're just like these rich people, I guess, in space. And they're like, yes, mm, we've discovered intelligent life. <laughs> How I didn't, quaint. I didn't read it like that. I don't know. No? They're already briefed. Like they're all scientists. Yeah, I, I guess know. so. I don't know. I just thought it was interesting. There's um, a lot of people. I, um, well, right. I was also just going to say, I thought it was also interesting. how that guy freaking, the, there's chicken sandwiches available. And he's like, do you have any ham? I'm like, are you an idiot? What an asshole. <laughs> why would you, why would you? Ask for ham when there's chicken, like are you psychopath? Maybe he's yeah. Maybe he's yeah. kosher. True. True. Wait, what? What? It's the <laughs> okay. opposite. But okay. <laughs> you know, there's like a lot of people opposite who. Of it, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of people who revere Kubrick to the extent that they think there's no accidents in his movies. Mm. Uh, this the is ham a, sandwich was one. This is not. <laughs> this is not a Shining podcast, but there's a lot of that stuff around Shining yeah. to the extent that there's a documentary called Room Two Three Seven that's just about people's different theories about what shit in the background means. Right. And I think that um, typically I'm like, you're dumb. Like Kubrick was interested in in getting his message across to the viewer, not hiding it. Mm. Um, but there's something in this movie that I actually think could be oh. uh, deeper. So there's a chess match between Hal and Frank, mm-hmm. and it's a real historical game. Right. Uh, and then right. and um, Hal says, "Oh, Frank, I think you missed it," and he starts to like kick his ass. But because it's a real historical game, people have studied it a lot. And there actually is another series of moves that Frank could have done that would have prolonged the game Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. Hal doesn't tell him about. And the question is whether that this is intentionally put in the movie as like foreshadowing that Hal withholds information and manipulates the humans. And the only reason that it's really even worth talking about is because Kubrick himself slayed at chess. He was really, oh. really good at chess. He would go and, and just make money playing in the park, like speed yeah. chess against really? randoms in New York. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I totally buy it. And like the fact that they did the research on like that historical chess match or whatever. He probably that, played that game himself. Yeah. It means that like they put thought into it. I <laughs> can totally buy that. It's that. He's, I, like, I mean, he's like making a joke about this like famous match that <laughs> existed. And he's like, I would have done this and I would have won. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't mean Stanley Kubrick. that the brand of beans in the background of yeah. the, are, yeah. like mean that the Overlook Hotel was built on an ancient Air- Indian burial ground and like, all that <laughs> crap. Like I don't yeah. dig that okay. stuff, but this I could see. I how um, you, like switched rooms around in the, 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 the oh s- yeah, we'll, we'll talk about another time. Um, uh, apparently in the novelization or in the screenplay or something, I, I read that uh, Hal was programmed because he, he's he's the super crazy artificially intelligent computer. He would beat them at chess every time. So he was programmed to let them win 50% of the time, apparently. And they all, like, the, the human astronauts pretended that, I think this is in the novelization. They, like, pretended to not know that. And so they would just, like, play these games. But they like how would intentionally lose sometimes to make okay. them not feel like completely overwhelmed the humans in this they're really um they're really robotic mm-hmm. you know they're not emotional people they're the type of people who are going to live together for 18 months on a ship right and they're really logical it's not only that it's like yeah it's not only that they're super logical it's that we don't really learn anything about their personal lives and in fact we are the one thing that we're shown about their personal lives when Poole gets a call from his parents on his birthday, he like watches it impassively and then is like, Okay, thanks, Hal. Lean me back a bit and goes back to sleep or whatever. And that's the only meaning I can glean from that scene is is characterizing him and, and the other astronauts. As because 
uh, because just like um, the information we get from them, mm-hmm. it's just like, why didn't they just cut this? Yeah. The, it actually talks about something, uh, a part of something that was cut. It talks about his like AGS reports or something. Right. It has to do with like his union and how he's getting paid. There was more dialogue around that. Oh, we, really? Yeah. And it's supposed <laughs> to separate the two astronauts that we know from the ones who are sleeping. How they're trained in different facilities and stuff like that. It's uh. supposed to expound on how how it's all fishy, but I guess oh, okay. it was unneeded, so they yeah. cut it. Yeah, it's interesting because, um, as I said earlier, Hal is really the most complex character in this story. He's really the only one that we encounter who has uh, identifiable um, f- feelings. And, we know his favorite goals. song. He has, <laughs> yeah, a back, he has a backstory it's in true. that way. He has a backstory, and we, we feel I, I feel like I know Hal better than I know any of the other characters in yeah. this movie. And I feel like, is that a choice? I mean, we talk about character arcs in movies, and normally that's something that we feel is important. But this is really not, like, because there isn't really a protagonist per se. I mean, like, the closest thing we have is, I guess, a Dave Bowman. But he just stands for humans. Yeah, we don't know anything. We know more about Hal than we know about him. So it's like, I don't, I, maybe that's also a big reason why I think it's all, like, pretty uncompelling as a piece of entertainment, is that I'm... Uh, you know, it's more of a it's more of a heady intellectual kind of exploration of these sort of feelings and ideas than it is a story that is being told to me, and I don't like that. <laughs> well, I'm through all my notes. Me too. Me too. Other than Hal was originally called Athena. That's it. That's my final fact. That's all I have. <laughs> Open the pod bay doors, Athena. Doesn't sound as good. I can't do that, buddy boy. <laughs> uh uh. uh. <laughs> 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 all right, guys. Next week we are doing. What do we say? Jurassic Park. Da, na, na. Yeah, Jurassic Park. Don't Re- sing it. Do Copyright. The, do the recorder version. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Stop. Spare us. Let's all bring in recorders. We're going to do that. Week. You guys can tweet at us at Carpal Critics. You can email us hello at carpalcritics.ca. Hello. 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 And that's it. That's I don't want to talk to you any it. other way. Tweet. Did you already say tweet us? Yeah, I did. Where, where were you? Tweet us. Um. We're on Twitter, so... uh, (laughs) See you later. Love you. Bye-bye.